In a world of Johnny's, Timmy's, and Spike's, we must all arrive at the win condition. Because <laughs> it's dinosaurs tail end. Sorry, go ahead. It takes a little while to get them online, but when they're online, they're really strong, and they're hard to deal with. Could that be the door we need to open to return to Kamigawa? So would you say there might be a possibility storm? Are you you suggesting a Blood Braid Elf storm deck? Hello again, and welcome back to the Wind Condition Podcast, your source for lore, news, and brews in the Magic the Gathering community. My name is Sean, I'm your host, I'm joined by my co-host Greg. How's it going, Greg? Doing good today. Well, it has been a crazy week so far. We got a lot to talk about today. And let's just remind everybody that this show is brought to you by Flipside Gaming at FlipsideGaming.com, where you can make an order of singles or sealed product, anything magic-related. And any order over $10, use that promo code WINCONDITION in all caps to save yourself 10% off your purchase, which will help contribute to future show giveaways. Well, Greg, let's jump right in because we got a lot to talk about today, including another final chapter in the Rivals of Ixalan story. So let's jet on over to Lore Corner. Uh, we start off with Huatli after she planes walks away from Ixalan. She goes immediately to Kaladesh, the only plane she has ever actually seen excluding Kaldine. Did she actually see Kaldine? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. Angrath did briefly take her there. My mistake, my mistake. Didn't take her, showed her. Show Anyhow, Huatli walks there and walks into the city unlike any other, of course. Aether swirly in the sky and just a hustle and bustle. So much, so many smells. And what are these people with six fingers on each hand? Oh, wait, we know them as the Vidalcan. Yeah. And you've got also uh, the, the Aetherborn and their ashy skin with the Aether floating beneath them. Everything was just unknown and awesome to her. Her, her tamales, though, that her family packed her, disintegrated. Oh. She had no food. But her amber made it. So she traded some amber for some coins, got some food, and was like, hey, where's cool stuff? So we can deduce from that that traveling through the blind eternities doesn't really, you know, support organic material that well. Unless you're the planeswalker. Unless you are the planeswalker, correct. Yep, yep, got to have that spark. And um, she gets pointed towards the center of town where there's an arena. And all the while, the time she's walking there, everybody is stopping her and talking about her armor. Because her armor is so distinct and different. And they're all asking her, who's your artificer? And, uh, of course, her response is, I have no idea what that is at all. So, after a little bit of while, she makes it to this uh, arena... And one of the Aetherborn that she doesn't know of yet is there sitting in the center talking about a new invention that will save the Aetherborn from having to die a very painful death. Which, as we know from Kaladesh, that was a thing. They hated it. It didn't work well for them. Few of them were vampires and could absorb others' life forces, but it's still not a great thing. And Watley was trying to think about how this could help as she was writing it all down. And somebody from behind her uh, says, Hey, are are you from here? Watley answers with, uh, No, I'm from out of town. And the lady leans in closer off of plane out of town. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Watley looks back and says, wait, you're a planeswalker too? The woman says, not here. Let's go somewhere else and talk. And she totally introduces herself, and it is none other than Sahili Rai. Yeah, I'm I'm just having a, a fun time here picturing this whole interaction because Wally is just so excited to be on a brand new plane. I mean, she's like the tourist 
you know, running around, taking pictures, throwing up peace signs, all this stuff. And yep. then here's Sahili Rai, who knows a whole heck of a lot more than she does. And Holly's like, hi, hi, how's it going? Yeah, hey, check it out. This is amazing. This is awesome. So he's, Sahili's like, uh, yeah, you need to tone it down a notch. Nobody else knows about this. So let's 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 go over here. A little so, bit. Yeah. And um, Sahili's like, your outfit is awesome. I it's so cool. I, of course, I had a feeling that you were not from here. Watley's like, what? What's this world called? And Sahili goes, well, it's Kaladesh, and you're in Girapur, and you uh, you're here at the right time. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And uh, Sahili, of course, asks, what plane are you from? Well, of course, she's never known of it called a different plane, so she called it Ixalan. Mm-hmm. That's the plane she's from. So I have a feeling that's why they didn't tell us the plane was Ixalan is because they wanted to leave it open for this little bit of story at the very end. Right. And then we actually get to see some of Hwatli's, um Warrior uh, poet. Yeah. I mean, Sahili asks her, you know, what's it like? And Hwatli's like, oh my gosh, I've never actually had to describe it to somebody you know, from a different plane before. And so she says she's going to describe it the only way she knows how. And so she goes into a, a little poem and it's very descriptive. And after this, after she uh, orates this poem, Sahili is just, wow, this is amazing. You know, what's a dinosaur? And then Watley's like, how do you not know what a dinosaur is? You're like scales, feathers. And Sahili's just like, uh, so they kind of, they keep talking and Sahili's like, I would love for you to, to tell me more about what a dinosaur is because I'd like to make one. And reading this story, you know, you can't help but think, oh my gosh, mechanized dinosaurs, like they may be taking a page from Transformers here, but you know, I digress. Um, it's a very funny and interesting interaction, and you just see, you know, two planeswalkers that we've seen fairly recently kind of bonding, and you can tell that there's a relationship forming there. Yeah. So we leave them as Watley continues to tell Sahili about her home. Uh, and then we pick up with everyone's favorite flame-chained minotaur, Angrath. So <laughs> Angrath returns home, and it looks just like when he left. Uh, it's described as a sleepy sort of place where, you know, very little has changed. So he goes back to his old forge, and there in the window is a sign saying open. Um, and he's, you know, slowly kind of walking on in there. And as he enters, he he sees two female minotaurs. You know, they're, they're probably in their, you know, if you were a human, probably your early 20s or late teens. Uh, but they are adorned with, uh, with accessories that single minotaur women would be wearing. So he knows they're not married, thank goodness. And uh, he, he walks up to them and there's a moment where they turn around and they see him and they all just kind of freeze. And then I'll just quote this part here. It says, the the two female minotaurs their eyes went wide the one on the right snorted in shock the other's ears stood up in surprise the one on the right sniffed the air and trembled with emotion father steam softly hissed or angrath's tears met his skin he smiled rumi jamira i'm home and it's really really nice to see you know angrath returns it's a, it's a happy story you know it's not the eldrazi have invaded and now everyone's a horror it's just it's it's good you know angrath is reunited with his daughters and uh you know they're obviously a lot older but all is right with angrath in his world it's definitely wholesome and we are all very very happy about the oh, return yeah. yeah so then who do we see next uh, so next, we pick up where we left Frasca, which I think, if we remember correctly, she was planeswalking away from Ixalan to Ravnica. So she literally leaves after the portal closes. She goes back, and obviously she goes home. She goes back to her study, and she is just so elated and happy to be home uh she picks up a history book there's a a letter a new one inside and there are but two words there meditation plane 
and a very familiar elegant script. Vraska grinned and cheerily shrugged off her jacket and began to change out of her sweat-stained clothes. No need to rush after all. So she, she grabs another book, puts it next to her table to read, and uh, tells herself we would have to wait until she met with the dragon. So she planes walks back to the meditation plane. Of course, Bullis is waiting there. And is very familiar water and everything there. Of course, he asks, what did you do? Did you do it? Did you take care of it? Of course she did. And uh, Nicol Bolas investigates by scouring her mind and looking at everything that happened. She remembered journeying upriver alone. With a very fine-toothed Bolas mind comb. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Diving into a river that ran through the city, watching as a sphinx rampage through Orozca, and then standing atop the immortal sun to turn said sphinx, along with dozens of ener- other enemies, into gold. Ooh. She remembered it all clear as day and gladly laid bare her mind for Bolas to inspect. And, of course, he says, you've done well. You will be rewarded. Here, a box. And what is given to her is a location where Gerard is held captive. And uh, he is alone and imprisoned there is what it says. And is congratulations guild leader Vraska as she returns back to Ravnica and uh, sets up some tea and starts to think about how she's going to petrify Gerard and what to say before that. But there was one other thing. She got home. And she starts to think there's something missing. She doesn't know what or why, but something was missing. But Bolas didn't see that. Nope. It looks like Jason Vraska's plan, at least the the second step, has gone off without a hitch. And Bolas suspects nothing of Jace's involvement. And uh, frankly, Vraska doesn't even know she saw Jace. So all seems to be moving according to plan. Yeah. Look at look at Jason Verasco with their conniving, plotting and scheming. I mean, going up against Bolus in his own category, that that says something. But it um, sure does. Yeah. So, anyway, we rejoin Where do we go next? Yeah, we we head back to Ixalan to the well, the newly unbanned Jace. <laughs> and he is uh he has shrouded himself in invisibility after wiping Vraska's mind, because obviously he doesn't want her to see him. And, yeah. you know, then Vraska's new thoughts all culminate and her plan is complete and she leaves. And so Jace then, you know, comes out of his shroud and uh, reaches out to Malcolm and whoa, whoa. tells him. Everybody leaves and he comes out. Well, yeah. Every, okay. So everybody leaves and he comes out and he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He communicates with Malcolm uh, telepathically, and he said, I'm leaving for a while. Uh, thank you so much. You were all so great, and, uh, you know, I'm going to leave. And so, you know, Malcolm says, okay, we'll, you know, we'll see you later. So Jace knew he had to go to Dominaria, but he's thinking to himself, wait, there's a lot that just happened between when I left the Gatewatch on Amonkhet and now. Like, will they know uh, about Vraska, like what if they run into her? What if, you know, he just runs through all these different situations that could have, you know, possibly happened in his mind, and what all is going? And then, uh, and then Jace looks at himself and he goes, "What these muscles? What the heck? He's never actually had like muscles before." And he has a little funny moment where he's like, oh, "I better talk to Gideon. I'm sure he has a training regiment that'll help me, you know, keep these going." So. Yep. Um, so anyway, he knows now that he needs to reach out across the blind eternities as he knows to communicate with or at least find another planeswalker, which will allow him to planeswalk to, you know, wherever he needs to go. Because he needs to, to revisit the team uh, and kind of go over the plan and how, you know, the ultimate goal is to frame and take down Nicol Bolas. Right. Um, he begins by thinking about Liliana, but... After his experience on Ixalan, uh, he kind of gets a sinking feeling in his stomach when he thinks about Liliana and like just how she's manipulated him and how you know uneasy that sits with him. So mm-hmm. he's like, eh, I'm not too excited about going to her first. You know, let's think about let's let's try Gideon. And so he uh, 
he reaches out uh, across the blind eternities and uh, finds Gideon is on Dominaria. Wait, he was expecting him on Ravnica, wasn't he? he yeah, I mean, he's he's thinking that people would maybe return to Ravnica, but um, but he sees him on Dominaria, and he's actually not stationary. He's not even just moving, like walking or running or even riding. He's moving fast, and Jace is like, what? How is he moving like that? I mean, he's moving so fast, it's to the point of this seems unnatural. Even right. for something that moves fast, like a Daredevil racer on Kaladesh. Mm-hmm. So he reaches out, and he's actually never had to hit a moving target before when he's planeswalking. So after a little bit of work and concentration, uh, Jace starts to pass on through to Dominaria, and as he is coming into this new plane on this what appears to be some sort of vessel moving at a rapid pace, he comes into a room of people who all kind of look at him awkwardly. And Jace looks back at him and is like, hey, everybody, what's going on? I'm just going to appear here. And uh, and then all of a sudden he sees Gideon come in the room and he's all Gideon and Gideon's like, oh my gosh, you know, you're not dead. And then Jace mm-hmm. is like, you know, yeah, what up? I'm here. I'm fine. I got a lot to tell you. But then as Gideon's coming near Jace, Greg, what happens? <laughs> we get this 70 uh, something year old woman with braided hair that looks at Jace and says, Who's the bookworm? Who is this woman, Greg? Or who do we think this woman is? Well, before we get to that, after this, the story stops. And, you know, we aren't going to see it for a couple months. Well, no, we we actually rejoin our emperor. Uh, uh, Sure. Anyhow, uh, speculation shows that this is Jaya Ballard. Oh, man. Which... The only other speculation is that Chandra is probably right there. And <laughs> we know we've seen artwork for uh, Jwara on Dominaria. Could we have Chandra, Jwara, and Jaya all on the same plane at the same time? I mean, I'm pretty sure Jaya and Jaya have been on the same plane for a long time. Uh, but it, it's more Jaya and Chandra is going to be exciting because... Obviously, Jaya started the Carol Keep Abbots on the plane of Ragatha, and Chandra has been there to train. So, what more can she learn from a master pyromancer? There you go. And, uh, yeah, and so the last part of this story, um, it's kind of, well, I, yeah, we'll, we'll go over it. It's not too terribly important but um, ultimately what this is is um if you guys remember during the course of rivals of ixalan uh wizard of the coast was doing a geocaching and survey where essentially everybody put their input of who should get a Rozka. uh okay if you followed this there was uh some contention i think it was between uh the merfolk and the sun empire mostly uh, the Sun, Pi- Sun Empire wins out because dinosaurs? <laughs> They're big. They're bad. They They're really strong. are. So essentially what this tail end of the story is talking about what's <laughs> happening. Dinosaurs tail end. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening uh, here at the back end of the story here on Ixalan. And it's talking about how uh, Emperor Apostek is taking his Temple Altasaur and his royal procession to Orozka to take it over because why not? So he had sent um, a guard of around a few hundred warriors into the city. Um, there were some River Heralds there. They didn't put up much of a fight. And ultimately, it's just telling us how he's going into the city and does not care about anything that Hawatli said because... Why should he care? And how the Sun Empire retakes the City of Gold. Right. And then the final line is the Emperor saying, The three aspects of the Sun shine bright, and thus begins a new age of conquest for the Sun Empire. Ixalan is ours, dot, 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 and Torazon is next. 
just like he wanted during his talk with Watley after she yeah. returned. Yeah. So now that she's gone, there's no one really there to second guess him. So conquest and power. That's all Apatzek is concerned about. All right. So we know we're going to return back in March for the yes. story. We still have a couple other story things we're going to talk about in the coming episodes. Specifically, we need to talk about Joyra's past. Yes, we do. So we can finally close the book on the threesome that we will rejoin in Dominaria of Karn, Teferi, and Joyra. Who Who's going to start writing the uh, magic story when we reach Dominaria? I don't know, Greg. Who is? Uh, uh, Martha Wells. Oh, okay. A new addition to the wizard story team. Which is always invited, uh, I think. Just thinking she might have written for uh, Stargate, maybe. Stargate? Like the TV show? I like the TV show. SG-1? So let's Ooh. see. She's also done some Star Wars. You know what? I will be excited for this. Yes, uh, absolutely. And also, one other thing to get excited about, Greg, we kind of glossed over this, but the vessel that Jace landed on, what wait. what do you think this vessel is? Could this could this vessel be a reincarnation of the Weatherlight? What if it is the Weatherlight that <gasps> was originally formed and possibly got copied out of time by Joyra and Teferi and Karn? Ooh, this is very didn't exciting. Didn't think about a clone. Whether like, did you? And I know when we went over that Dominaria art that was first released a couple weeks ago, you could see the outline of an airship in the background. So, uh, did you or did you not see the artwork for the Dominaria art book? I did. And did there, you see you... those mega structures in the sky? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's very interesting, and uh, you know, I uh, I'm gonna have to get used to seeing that new magic logo on the face of magic. I just, uh, I don't know. I'll I'll get there one day. I'm sure. I know. Uh, especially especially when we get to uh, get to play arena, which they've announced uh, will be coming to Mac, possibly even at the end of the testing process. Ooh. So. I don't know if they're expecting Mac users to apply now, hoping they'll get in at the very end, or if they have to, you know, apply at the very end once they've announced it. But either way, it'll come to us eventually, and I'm excited. Um, All right. So that sounds a little bit too much like a, a, a news or announcement story. So let's head over. Let's head over to as foretold. <laughs> Man, there's just too much information going around right now. There was a lot this week, wasn't there? There really, really was. So we're going to do our best to cover what we can, and, uh, and then we'll actually transition at the end into our bruise segment with some uh, some of the biggest news of the week. But uh, anyway, Greg, there was a, a series of announcements that came out, I want to say, on, on Wednesday yeah, that that was Valentine's Day, you know. Do, do Wizards you like was playing, giving us some love. Do you like play, what are your favorite formats to play, Greg? Like let's say you go to a pre-release <sighs> weekend. What are your favorite formats to play? I mean, my favorite format to play in a pre-release weekend is and will always be Two-Headed Giant. Indeed. Was, Giant was there something fun. announced that works with that? You know, I, I wish that there would be some wizard-specific product release that would cater to two-headed giant. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Hold what? on. It looks like Wizards is coming out with a product called Battle Bond. Yeah. Greg, Which what is, is Battle Bond? This is going to be a two-headed giant limited deck play. So essentially, what? it's going to be set up to be played in sealed deck or booster draft. And it'll be a mix of new cards and reprints, but the real benefit to this is it's designed for two-headed giant. I mean, we're just going to get to play all sorts of great magic that works together with playing with an ally. I mean, we saw some of this in Oath of the Gatewatch, but 
they're really getting into it. They really want to play with that. And um, we're also going to a new plane. Did you see where we're going? I did. I did. I'm actually looking at it right now. And that whole, do you wonder, that whole entire paragraph is actually quite exciting. Um, he says, Gavin Verhey wrote this article, and he says, In Battle Bond, we're going to Kylem, a never-before-seen plane in the multiverse. On this world, beings flock from all over the plane to the arena of Valor's Reach, where two-on-two combat is the pinnacle of sport. The goal of the combatants, get ready, isn't to kill their opponents outright, but to defeat them with style and flair. It's not really a win unless your spells and spectacles cause the crowd to go wild in the process. Greg, this is exciting. Yeah, no. Uh, oh, gosh. I mean, are we going to commentate on these games? I mean, we might have to. <laughs> this just seems like too much fun. I mean, obviously, with your competitive tournaments with, you know, 60 card constructed, the goal is to defeat your opponent outright. But in a, in a format... I mean, we play Commander. You know, a lot yeah. of people love doing these grandiose combos in Commander, but this set is going to be specific to that style of play, which is very exciting. Oh, I, I cannot talk to how excited I am for this. Now, uh, when is that coming out? Uh, that will be coming out uh, around June 8th. So be yes. ready for Battle Bond to be coming out um, around June 8th. Do you know what that's right before? I do not know what that's... Is that... Wait. It, wait. This is coming out right before GP Vegas. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. So, so, so there, the there's going to be a bunch of stuff. The main event at GP Vegas yeah. is Two-Headed Giant. You heard it here first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only, right? If only. Yeah, All right. right. Uh, so, so continuing on, there's a couple other things... Um, as we talk about Battle Bond and the ideas of f flair and style and uh, lore, kind of here, uh, we got the signature spellbook series starting yes. off with Jace. Now, this mm -hmm. is going to be replacing the From the Vault series because From the Vault, as we know, didn't do too well with Transform. They haven't and said that outright, but you can kind of infer. It says it's the successor. So what this is going to be is it's going to have a premium foil and eight cards that fit with the Planeswalker's identity, and it's going to be around 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be, once again, another June release, but just imagine, what type of spells could we expect to see from a Jace-specific grouping of nine cards? Uh, I mean, Omniscient, could you imagine that? Not in a $20 pack. No, no, can't what? imagine that. Sorry. Really? I mean, All I can right. see Jace's Ingenuity, Jace's Phantasm, um, maybe Jace's Archivist, you know, but I, I can't, because uh, if there's nine cards plus one foil and it's a $20 pack, that averages to just around $2 a card. And I can't see them printing anything over you know, $10, let alone like, you know, 7 or $8 in this pack. I mean, it'll be fun, you know, but I'd be very curious. I will be very curious to see, just like these challenger decks, what all they will be able to cram into these to make them attractive to buy for the more experienced Magic player. You mean like me and you? Exactly, you know. <laughs> so, yes. I mean, at, tw at 20 bucks for nine cards, that's a heck of a booster pack. So That is... You know, I mean, unless it's random. <laughs> no, I, I doubt it's going to be random. Yeah, yeah. So. We'll All see. right. So we've got that coming June fifteenth. Then we have another announcement, which is pretty exciting. Uh, there's an official Magic: The Gathering companion app called Magic: The Gathering Portal, and with this app, players will be able to create, manage, and track home tournaments. So you can create your own tournament put it out there and people who are searching will be able to find it. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. I mean, not only for local game stores, but like, let's say I've actually dabbled with this idea myself. You know, let's say you want to put a tournament together and just throw it out there. There's a lot of players in Fresno. And if you're like, hey, I bought a box. I want to have a tournament, you know, and winner can, you know, get the box or whatever. That would be so cool. People could search it up, find it, and then respond and sign up, blah, 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 blah. You can look up card information on the fly. So they'll have a whole litany. I mean, they probably should have the whole entire Magic database searchable for you. So it'll be almost like a portable gatherer in the app. Um, 
keep track of your life totals, which is great. Stay, uh, stay up to date on Magic News, so it looks like they'll have a daily MTG section on there. Um, keep in touch, kind of like a social network for Magic players. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just learn more about Magic through videos, tutorials, glossaries, and rule lookups. So this is pretty exciting. I mean, Magic hasn't had an all-inclusive companion app yet. Uh, there's been a lot of life total counters, a lot of deck building apps, a lot of um, ways to look up cards. But this is very interesting, and I'd love to see the finished product once it's released. Um, it will be later in 2018. No specific dates yet, but very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, it'll be nice. I don't know. I, I, I have a bunch of apps that I like using already for Magic. Um, mm -hmm. So it's hard to say that there's going to be one that I'm going to want to replace with this, but it'll be nice to have it. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it works. Yeah. Um, so we've got more announcements. There's three more to come. Yep. Jeez. They really gave us a lot to talk about. They uh, really did. So they told us uh, that we are going to be getting Commander Anthology Volume 2. The which year will... after Commander Anthology Volume 1. I, I think what ended up happening is Commander Anthology just worked really well, and with them dissolving the the, uh, the dual decks, it doesn't seem like the dual deck one did well, and the Plain Chest Anthology didn't do well. So why would they do an Arch Enemy when they could just do Commander again? So they're going to do it again. We're going to get it on June 8th. We're going to get four more decks, uh, and it'll have 13 premium foil commanders, which means you could probably get your hands on foil generals that aren't already foil. Right. And I think with the... Um, I think it was two years ago that they started printing the actual commanders in the deck, in the sealed deck, as foils, um, mm -hmm. which is definitely something commander players love, is getting their decks blinged out, uh, make them look all quote-unquote pimp, if you will. Um, but, you know, these commander anthologies, especially this last one, gave you the first opportunity to have Marin as a foil, which made that whole package very appealing. I mean, if you have most all of the other cards, you could buy it, get your get your Marin, and then either sell off some of the other cards or, you know, just have other decks for your friends to play with when they come over. Um, so Don't this forget is about that Freilis. That was the first time, too. Oh, that's right. Freilis as well. Because um, can you imagine if when they had the planeswalker generals if they printed those in foil how amazing that would have been i'm willing to bet you we're gonna get to fairy in this one well that would be very exciting um and then also piggybacking off of this they announced commander 2018 will be released august 10th 2018 oh. so well before christmas time and there's some speculation that they may revisit the whole idea of Planeswalkers as your general in this set. I mean, Which, that'd be sweet. That would be very sweet. And with the foiling of, you know, a couple cards in each set, you could get foil Planeswalker generals. That would be so sick. That would be really sweet. Like, yeah. very happy. And then what's our last announcement here? La last announcement here is... Um, they're trying something a little new with a pair of Chinese market specific Planeswalker decks featuring new Planeswalkers created particularly for China. And it doesn't stop there. The artwork uh, it will be inspired by Chinese artists and it's just going to be a very, very cool ethnic kind of product that Wizards is going to release, uh, which, which is super cool because, you know, we've gone through a lot of talk this last year about inclusivity within Magic. And we know that we talked last week about them releasing those um, those lucky packs for mm -hmm. the Lunar New Year. And it was, you know, it, it's very exciting to see this happen. So they could transition you know, maybe next year to different countries and just expand the horizons of what magic is capable of producing and printing. So, so as a question, yes. since they're looking at these two new planeswalkers and dual decks to go into the aesthetics of the Chinese culture, do you think they might be going to that same plane that Portal Three Kingdoms came from? I mean, yeah, I could. You could definitely could see it? that. 
Could I'm, we if, maybe see some Portal 3 Kingdoms reprints? In possibly foil. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine getting like horsemanship to be an ability again? If it's only printed in an ancillary product, I mean, we did get Storm reprinted in the Mind versus Might dual deck, so whoa, nothing's whoa. off we the also, table. We also got Storm reprinted in Unstable. You thought, okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. But um, that actually would beg the question, if they were to transition into Japan, could that be the door we need to open to return to Kamigawa? Well, this could be a test just to see what type of interest there's going to be for that because they've already delved into the Japanese culture, the Chinese culture, and got burned on it with Kamigawa. So it's a big possibility. Sure, but, yeah. And with, with the new advancements uh, within the development team and the new staff they've brought on, I think that they're a lot better equipped to create sets, even if it is involving visit less popular planes from the past so you know we'll see we'll see how it goes down i'm very very excited to see what they produce all right i think well, we all are definitely we've managed to go 40 minutes into this podcast without talking about it but here it is <laughs> ladies and gentlemen this past monday news flash jace the Mind Sculptor and Bloodbraid Elf have been removed from the ban list, making them legal to play in modern. Yeah. And the world is blown up. Everything. Oh my I mean, gosh. It's insane you, right now. If you wanted to play a game where you listened to podcasts, watched YouTube videos, uh, read articles, and every time you saw or heard the word Jace, you took a drink, you'd, you'd be done after about 20 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if you'd even get past move. 20 minutes. Everything yeah. and everybody has been talking about Jace ever since we got that um, that that spoiler from uh, a player that the playtesting beta of Moto had Jace legal. Right. I mean, it was Jace, and I think Bloodbraid Elf were both legal, and people were like, wait. Are they getting legal? Are they going to be unbanned in modern? What is mm -hmm. this craziness? And everybody's kind of like, all right, all right, well, maybe this is just some marketing or maybe somebody screwed up. They could have been doing the Future Future League. We just saw Star City Games running a no ban list event for modern. There's been a lot of people speculating on why we shouldn't be playing with them. And then out of the corner, coming from behind, they unban them. Well, I think that it's huge that Star City Games proposed the whole idea of a no-ban event because the reaction to that was, in in my opinion, overwhelmingly positive from what I've seen. You know, everyone's yes. excited about it. They're like, give us our toys. Let us play with powerful cards. Like, this is, you know, what we've always wanted. You know, a lot of people are thinking this ban list is too big. There's too many cards on it. Um and uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was amazing to see, if you had the opportunity this last week to watch um, they, uh, Magic Puts on Stream on Twitch, uh, I believe it's Tuesday night, the um, uh, uh, Modern Team Super League. And if you got a chance to watch, you got to see a blue-white Miracles deck in Modern featuring Jace. And it was amazing like just the power level that you you get mean being, busted right uh, yeah i mean being able to brainstorm in modern uh now obviously there's going to be a lot of people testing with jace you, you can listen to a bunch of podcasts watch a bunch of youtube videos again people talking about potential brews there's a lot of streamers who are streaming these these decks featuring jace um but one thing that I found extremely exciting was uh, when uh, Saffron Olive was playing this deck, he w he had a Jace out, surprise, and he, he brainstormed, and on his opponent's turn, he was able to cast Opt into Terminus, miracling you know, away his opponent's two Gurmag Anglers. Uh. And that moment right there really made me think, like, this is getting crazy the power level that jace brings to modern is nuts now let's not forget we did not have opt in modern you know a year ago six months ago before ixalan you know yeah that was a legacy card 
that got introduced to modern. And now we see another one with Jace being introduced to modern. No one has ever played with Jace in modern before this last week. And um, I, I honestly believe that, call this a conspiracy theory, but maybe Wizards is testing the waters to try out legacy staples in modern. Because if they want to hold tight on their reserve list and not print these dual lands ever again, then your your pool of players for Legacy is going to drop. But oh, if yeah. you were to slowly introduce more and more powerful cards from Legacy into Modern while at the same time rolling out a newer format, like a newer Modern format, I know we had Frontier, there are people who are saying Ixalan forward for Arena, whatever. But, 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 if you were to be able to play legacy decks in a modern format i don't know greg that that sounds like something way down the line that actually could happen i mean do you agree or disagree i mean i'm ultimately i I think i talked to my uh compatriots at the store about this how i'm seeing it what's going to end up happening is that they are going to go forward we're going to see in the next few years uh a change up where legacy is going to pretty much just die out and no bandless modern will be the new play and then we'll get an extended format that won't be like modern but it won't be like extended we're just waiting on the time that they'll probably set us up to be when the uh border art changed most recently and it'll be from then on right right because nothing in modern is on the reserve list. So you're allowed to reprint any of those things to, to heck, you know? Yeah. And there's plenty of cards in Legacy, like the Dual Lands, like uh, Candelabra, like a whole bunch of other reserve list specific cards um, that you can't print anymore if Wizards wants to stick to their guns. But there's a lot of people that do enjoy the intricacies of Legacy. So if you were to introduce more Legacy cards into Modern, you might be able to satisfy people's itches while at the same time keeping those collectors happy with this I mean, ridiculous reserve list they have. Storm the Vault, Growing Rights of Itlamok, those were all chances for them to create cards that were essentially legacy playable for a standard format. They may not be as busted because they don't do it instantly, but when you do get them off, they are crazy good. Uh... I I built a new EDH deck the other day that focused around copying spells and everything. Copies. Just copies. And I'm running Storm the Vault and Growing Rights, and it just gets kind of crazy sometimes. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, those are two of those flip cards with lands on the other sides that are definitely on the reserve list and definitely of an absurd power level. So... But uh, making them how they play here, you know, it takes a little while to get them online. But when they're online, they're really strong and they're hard to deal with. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Which makes Field of Ruin all the better. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. All right. So does Ghost Quarter. Um, so yep. as we talk about this, the unbanning, let's move our way into Bruce. Let's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's head down to the Brewmaster's lair. What we're talking about here, of course, it's going to be modern. Everybody's talking about modern and how these two cards are going to be changing the format. Right. Um, I know... Uh, Sean, you you have something that you're super excited for, and it feels super polarized on the responses you've been getting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's actually been my first real experience diving into a social media forum with an idea of my own. And, you know, I knew I was going to get some, some feedback that was, you know, colorful, but um, I'll... Uh, I'll, I guess I'll just kind of throw it out there and we'll see. So we wanted to talk about some cards that we feel are brew-worthy or experimental with these unbanned cards. Obviously, we have Jason Bloodbraid Elf. Um, so what I wanted to start with is uh, Bloodbraid Elf, if you are unfamiliar, is an elf berserker 
For two, a red and a green, it is a 3-2 haste creature with Cascade. Cascade says, when you cast this spell, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. You may cast it without paying its mana cost. Put the exiled cards on the bottom in a random order. So... You must cast Bloodbraid Elf in order to take advantage of the Cascade Trigger, which unfortunately takes it out of the realm of cards that will blink, quote-unquote blink, or flicker. So if it exits the battlefield and enters the battlefield, you will not get the benefit. It'll just be a 3-2 for haste. Um, now, there was a card that was printed recently in Rivals of Ixalan, and it was sort of... Uh, enigmatic in that people would read it and they would say is this good is this bad we don't know we'll have to wait and see and the card that i'm talking yeah. about is release to the wind for two and a blue you get an instant that says exile target non-land permanent for as long as that card remains exiled its owner may cast it without paying its mana cost so it's not a flicker effect. It doesn't come right back into play, and it doesn't necessarily give nope. the card you uh, exile flash. So if you do play this on a creature, it does have to be cast during your turn, unless, of course, it has flash. So the interaction that I am very excited to experiment with is casting Release to the Wind on your own Bloodbraid Elf. So, essentially, the play pattern looks something like you cast your Bloodbraid Elf, you cascade into something of value, a creature, a kill spell, what have you. So you get a two-for-one there. Well, then your opponent says, okay, well, your Bloodbraid Elf is being kind of a nuisance. I want to kill it. So I'm going to target it. I'm going to, you know, burn it. I'm going to lightning bolt it. And you go, okay, well, I'm going to cast Release to the Wind, and I'm going to exile my Bloodbraid Elf. You know, and then during your opponent's turn or whatever, they say go, and then it comes back to your turn, or even later on your turn, you get to cast your Bloodbraid Elf again without paying its mana cost, getting another Cascade Trigger off of it. So, it yeah. seems like pretty good value, and also, Release to the Wind is a very flexible card. Um, I know when I actually posted this uh, interaction on the uh, Masters of Modern Facebook group, I was looking for some feedback. And a lot of people were saying, well, that's just bad, because if you cascade into Release the Wind with your Bloodbraid Elf, you won't even be able to target your Bloodbraid Elf because it's still on the stack. This is true. However, Release the Wind can also be used as a pseudo-removal spell for your opponent. So if you release to the wind your opponent's creature, clearing the way for Bloodbraid Elf, you can get in for an extra three points of damage. Or if you play a teamer value deck like I've been trying to brew up here with like Snapcaster Mages and Dire Fleet Daredevils and maybe Tarmogoyfs, you have a target for that release to the wind. So let's say you go, you know, turn three, you cast your Dire Fleet Daredevil, you cast your opponent's Thoughtseize, right? Boom, you get some value there. Next turn, you cast your Bloodbraid Elf, and you happen to cascade into Release the Wind. Well, you can target your own Dire Fleet Daredevil, cast it again, take another card out of your opponent's graveyard. So it's not so much as like, oh my god, look at how broken this combo is. It's more of a, hey, this card is extremely flexible, and it works very well in conjunction with a card that was just taken off the ban list. So I wanted to throw that out there to you guys and see if anyone's willing to, you know, come along with me and try to brew a deck, a teamer deck, or maybe four colors that includes Bloodbraid Elf and Release to the Wind. I mean, Greg, do you think that this is potential or is this just trash? Mm, I think this has an option that can be played. It does give you that distance you're looking for. Uh, no, I don't think it's just trash like people think because people are... Uh, well, yeah. One of our super well, previous say, segments called you. Broken or Crap would totally take <laughs> the place that we're doing here. But um, And then also I wanted to throw in board wipes. You know, sorcery speed board wipes like Supreme Verdict will come down definitely. But if you're able to release to the wind your Bloodbraid Elf while your opponent's board wiping, that allows you to rebuild very quickly so you can cast your Bloodbraid Elf for free on your next turn, cascade into another creature, and you still have all your mana up to cast more creatures. Um, 
you know, so yeah. it's it's definitely Goblin Bushwhacker maybe in this deck as well because Surge won't be a problem when you Cascade and he gives all your creatures haste when he comes in, so you can put a beating on your opponent relatively quickly. So, wait, Bushwhacker has Kicker. Does it have kick? What's the Surge one? I'm thinking about. I don't remember, but you're right. There is one that costs less for Surge and gives you haste right. or something yep, like yep, that. You're right. Anyhow. Anyhow. Um, so, so yeah. that's my that's my idea for uh, to try to brew around with Bloodbraid Elf. I know people are thinking Jun strategies, they're thinking other teamer strategies, but just a little food for thought there. Release to the wind. Maybe we found some way to actually use this card. I still think there's a four way. It's going to be four color decks again. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. Because um, this this just is not bad, and. It's an elf berserker, right? It is an it's elf berserker, human? so you won't be able to run it in humans. Yeah. Okay. Whoa, whoa. You could run it in humans. I just don't think it's good enough. Right. Right. But could you see this getting played in humans? I mean, um, or or the, just a control the, deck, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, maybe yeah, we'll see the return of Burning Tree Emissary. Oh, that would be another great card to throw into a teamer deck, because I mean, mana, mana, mana cast more spells, put more creatures out, seems pretty good to me. Yeah. Um, and then let's jump on over real quick um, to Jace. Um, if you're running Jace, you're probably going to run counter spells. Yeah. And what we, we do not have just straight up counter spell legal in modern, unfortunately. But, 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 there was a deck that was prominent in the cons of Tarkir block called Esper Dragons, and it would run a spell called Sulamgar Scorn, which if you reveal a dragon or control a dragon, it costs blue, blue, and it says counter target spell. So, I don't know. I mean, we talked about blue-white miracles. Maybe we see a blue-white control deck featuring Dragon Lord Ojitai and Sulamgar Scorn. I mean, it's I mean, possible. You, you also, you know, don't forget about what is it called? Icefall Regent, um, the the dragon from Dragons of Tarkir that also could be revealed to cast this, and it can be cast to tap down an opponent's creature as long as it's out there. Um, yeah. There's there's engines to be explored, you know, and I know everyone's first thought is to gravitate towards the metagame and find how these can improve already existing decks. But I'm challenging you guys, you know, go deep. Find those new combinations that will, you know, allow you to brew new decks and bring them to your, your local FNM events. Play some modern. Open people's eyes. This format is wide open, and the possibilities are legitimately endless. So, so would you say there might be a possibility storm? There's definitely a possibility storm. <laughs> yes, Greg. Absolutely. It Jeez. might even warp the world, huh? Oh, my God. Stop. <laughs> Stop! I'm gonna chaos warp you to the bottom of the deck. So, oh, but I'm a commander. I can't. That, can't, that doesn't happen to me. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, um, ultimately, what's gonna come other, down? Any other things you wanted to touch on in terms of brewing with some of these new unbanned cards? Um, I mean, anything that's a three drop is gonna be good, really. I mean, just just imagining. Um, who doesn't want to blood braid into an anguish on making exile permanent lose three life, then swing in for three. I mean, you're not really losing out on anything, but it allows you to get rid of anything. That's true. And with I mean, the if release you're of a Jace, the mind sculptor, a card like anguish on making could totally blow open a deck. And if you're running Anguished Unmaking with Bloodbraid Elf, that's green, red, white, and black. White and red is in there, too, so you could run Lightning Helix and get that three life back that you spent to cast Anguished or, Unmaking. Or, or Boros Charm. Or Boros Charm, indeed. All of which cost less than four, and you can cascade into those. That yeah, definitely there's, sounds... There's, there's so much play that you can play with. I mean, even if you go with like a teamer build with this, and you give yourself access to both Bloodbraid and Jace... Uh, there's so much to be done. It's pretty much impossible to not have cards be good. I mean, even... Uh, what's that card you like? I think it's Unsubstantiate. Unsubstantiate, sure. Is I mean, even good with Bloodbraid Elf. Yeah, bounce your opponent's creature. I mean, you don't have to return a spell to an opponent's hand. Well, well moment. So if you really wanted to be funny and you got nothing to do, you could unsubstantiate your own Bloodbraid Elf if it's getting countered. 
Are you, are you suggesting a Bloodbraid Elf Storm deck? Ooh, <laughs> I mean, no, because nobody I'm not wants saying to spend, that it couldn't get played. Nobody wants to spend eight mana to cast Bloodbraid Elf twice. I mean, that's just kind of that's kind of ridiculous. But but let's think about this: if you Bloodbraid Elf into a Burning Tree Emissary, cast a Burning Tree em Emissary, then you do a Biretic Ritual, tap one, and cast your Empty the Warrens for eight. Or for uh, four copies, uh, is, is that bad? Oh my or gosh. metamorphos sure. into tendrils? You know, there's a lot of open space here to play. There really is. There really is. Oh, another thing that I was thinking about too, with this whole uh, release to the wind, Bloodbraid Elf, run, uh, run Eternal Witness. That's a three drop that you can cascade into. You know, Get like you if you were to, else. yeah, if you were to, you know, release the wind, you know, on your Bloodbraid Elf. And then recast your Bloodbraid Elf into a Eternal Witness. You could get back your Release the Wind and do it all over again. Yeah. I mean, it's just value, value, value. So, all right. Well, we've kind of gone over these these uh, Bruin ideas. You know, yeah. are they good? Are they not? We'll have to wait and see. But the most fun part is actually brewing them up and testing them out. So, yeah. Let's take yeah. our new None. toys. Let's build with them and see what we can do. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Greg, that's going to wrap it up for us. Let's uh let's remind everybody that this show is brought to you by Flipside Gaming. Visit flipsidegaming.com where you can order any magic product, other games as well. Any order that you have over $10, use that promo code WINCONDITION in all caps, save yourself 10% off your purchase and that will help contribute to future show giveaways. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us up to the end. Greg, where can these fine people find you? Uh, you can find me at Noob Slasher 2003 on Twitter. And you can find me at MTG underscore Sean. The show is at The Wind Condition. Check us out on Instagram at, MT, at uh, The Wind Condition MTG. We'll have a link to our YouTube channel in the show notes. And all that being said, Greg, thanks again. Always, always a pleasure. And we will talk to y'all next week. You guys have fun playing your magic. <laughs>